Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our coming back for our combined Bible study. Thank you for returning us to the epistle of James. Thank you for the love and interest you have given your children. And we're here tonight so we can be taught of you. We pray, Lord, you'll teach us yourself. And great will be our blessing and peace in Jesus' name. We pray that our coming here will not be in vain. We pray that your hand will be upon our lives. You'll transform our lives and you'll mold us to the vessels of honor that you want every one of us to be. Do good in the life of everyone, O Lord. And let your word enrich the life of everyone in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Make us channels of blessings. In Jesus' name, we pray. I happily welcome every one of you to our combined Bible study again in Jesus' name. For some time, we have left off the epistle of James. And we're coming back to the epistle of James tonight. And it's such a refreshing idea as we come to this very rich and practical epistle. We're now in chapter 4, but I want to remind you of uh, James chapter 1 verse 22. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James tells us that uh, the epistle contains practical instructions. Light to lighten our way, water to wash and cleanse. And there will be fire there too to melt and mold our lives. The hammer, which is a symbol for the word of God, is there to break hard hearts in pieces. And of course, there is nourishment or food, spiritual food, to give us strength and spiritual healing. In fact, physical healing as well. And as we hear these words, then we are being told that we should listen, we should meditate on the word, and then apply the word to our hearts and be doers of the word. And I pray that the grace to be doers of the word, the Lord will grant unto every one of us in Jesus' name. As you would remember, we have already uh, covered chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. We're now in verse 11 of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 11 and verse 12 is what we're looking at today. Please open your Bible as we read together. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Those are the verses we are looking at today. And the topic of our study is the great sin of evil speaking. The epistle of James contains a practical subject. As I have told you, in fact, it gives us the very test of the true Christian, of the genuine Christian. And from chapter 1, if you read through, it says, here is a test. And then it gives us the various points, how we meet trial, how we endure temptation, how we are slow to speak, how we are quick to hear, how we are doers of the word, how there is a bridle in our mouth, how then we do not judge one another, how we obey the commandments of the Lord, not only nine out of ten, because he that obeys one and nine and then disregards a one is still a breaker, a disobedient uh, lawbreaker, and there will be judgment upon him. Then he goes on to faith with works, that it is by our works we are going to demonstrate we have faith in the Lord. You know that all those subjects are very, very practical. He comes in chapter 3 and talks about our tongue and talks about the way we ought to use our tongue. Then he talks about practical wisdom that we ought to have. And then in chapter 4, he introduces us to uh, more practical subjects 
that there should be no war, no strife in the midst of the children of God. That if we need anything from the Lord, simply ask and the Lord will give. And then he tells us about submission to the Lord, about humility, because God grants more grace unto the humble. And now he comes to this at verse 11, and he talks about something very, very practical, which happens to us in our day-to-day experiences. He says, speak not evil one of another. Yeah, he's telling us what is very common to the unregenerate sinners. The unregenerate sinners, as we look at the New Testament, are referred to as slanderers. They are backbiters, or they are whisperers. Or they are the people that will destroy and spoil other people behind them. And you find them, whether they are young people, whether they are students, whether they are teenagers or adults, they gather in small groups. And they'll be talking and speaking evil, bearing tales of other people to destroy the good names of others. But then he says, if we are born again, here is another test that will show we will not speak evil one of another. The tale bearer who speaks evil of other people is severely condemned in the Bible because of the sin of slander and malicious gossip. Speaking evil of others, speaking evil of their action, of their motive, and judging their manner of life and their families behind them is a great sin in the sight of God. And those who indulge in such backbiting and evil speaking, they show that they do not love their neighbors as themselves. Because you don't want others to gossip about you, to backbite and to criticize you. And what you don't want others to do to you, you will not do to them. But James is telling us something. He tells us, the Lord has commanded us that we should not speak evil of other people. If we then break that law, which is a law of law, and we set ourselves above the law of God, disregarding the law of God. It says, we are not doers of the law, but we are judges over the law. And we are usurping God's authority. Because the right of judgment belongs to God alone. And the man or the woman that goes about judging other people, speaking evil about them, he takes law into his hand, and he makes himself a judge rather than a doer of the law. And he takes to himself a right to do only what God can do, which uh, he has no right to do. Because of that, then the judgment of God comes heavily upon him. That's a summary of what we have in those uh, two verses, 11 and 12. We're not going to go through and we're going to uh, analyze and look at other scriptures to back up the teaching of scripture we're having in those two verses. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, the unrighteous practice of evil speaking and lawlessness. The unrighteous practice of evil speaking and lawlessness. Number two, usurping the place of God, who is the only lawgiver. Usurping the place of God, who is the lawgiver. Number three, the unique position of the judge and the lawgiver. Let's come back to James chapter 4, verse 11. I'm reading now the first part of verse 11. It says, speak not evil one of another brethren. Once again, I want to remind you because of the use of the word brethren. James was rising, writing to the people that had known the Lord, the people that profess to be following the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that those who are born again, it's like you are born into a family. The people that are born before you into that family, they call you a brother, they call you a sister, because you are related to them. And we are related to one another by the blood of the Lamb. And it says then, if we are brethren, if we are members of the same family, let us show it by the way we relate to one another. Do you say you are a brother? Do you say you are a sister? Here is one proof. Speak not evil one of another. That will be the mark of a real child of God. You recognize as you read immediately, you read this verse, you see that this is a command. It says, speak not evil. It's not a suggestion, it's not an idea, it's not an opinion, it's a command. Why did he give this command? Number one, because we are brethren. Because we are children of God. 
because we are related together and there should be love in our midst and where there is love there will be no evil speaking number two because what we are talking about in the life of our fellow brother if we look very very closely we might see the reflection in our own lives why then will we expose what other people are doing and then we cover up our own number three because it's the grace of god that makes us to be different why it not for the grace of god in your life in my life we'll be doing exactly that same bad thing that that other fellow is doing number four because we did even similar things before and the Lord forgave us and he covered up all our faults. If he has covered up our faults, he then says, what mouth have we? What authority have we to be speaking evil about the other person because exactly what he is doing, we have done before and the Lord has forgiven us. Other parts of the scripture, they tell us the same thing in Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 verse 2. It says to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Here he tells us to speak evil of no man. This one even goes beyond what uh, James has been speaking about. James has been talking to the brethren. And he said, we're members of the same church. We should encourage one another, lift up one another, move on one another. And so that through you and through me, our fellow brothers and sisters will make progress. If we speak evil against them, they're going to be discouraged. That's what James is talking about. But now Titus is saying, it's not even limited to the church members alone. You will not speak evil of any man. It's is it your boss in the place of work? Is it a colleague in the place of work? Are you teaching and there is a teacher? Uh, you know, a, a colleague who is also a teacher. Are you a student, a teenager? You'll not speak evil of your teacher. And you'll not speak evil of your parents. You'll not speak evil of anyone. Speak evil of no man. And then be no brother. You'll not be shouting on them, bullying on them. You'll be gentle and you'll be showing all meekness unto all men. All men. It takes the grace of God to be able to obey that and of course if we are born again we will be able to obey that in our lives in 1st Peter chapter 2 1st Peter chapter 2 reading from verse 1 wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings then it says he's commanding us to do that because he knows already we have a deposit of the grace of God in our lives when we were born again he said as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby if if so, ye have learned, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. He said, if we have come to have the grace of God, and that grace of God now is in our lives, there is one way we're going to show it, the negative things in that verse 1 will not be in our lives. We'll desire the sincere milk of the word of God, and that word of God, he'll be showing us what we ought to do, what we ought not to do, how we ought to talk, how we ought not to talk, how we need to relate with our fellow brothers and sisters. Come back to that verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, all hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speaking. The very first thing I want you to notice there is the companions of evil speaking. Evil speaking doesn't stand alone. There are some other things that are associated with evil speaking. And when you have evil speaking in your life, look very well. You, are, you will see that you have other things as well. There is malice there. Because if you are speaking evil of somebody, you don't love that person. There is malice against that person. You don't have the love of God or in your heart towards that person. And also it says, all oh, guile. There is deceit. There is deception. There is exaggeration. And you want to color that story. You want to add to that thing. Oh, brother, so and so. Sister, so and so. See what he has done. See what he has done. And for the person you are talking to, to believe you. To know that you are saying something very, very weighty, very important. You are likely to add a little to the story. And then it talks about hypocrisy. Actually, as you are judging your brother, you know that one finger may be pointing to your brother. The other four fingers are pointing to you. You know that the things you are judging your brother for, you are judging your sister for, you are guilty also about that thing. That's hypocrisy. And then there is envy. Actually, you may be speaking evil of your brother, speaking evil of your sister because you are envious. He has something that you are jealous of. He has a position, he has a privilege which you don't have. And because of that jealousy, 
see you are speaking evil. You see the companions of evil speaking there. If you avoid one, you avoid the whole thing. If you have one, it's likely the others may be in your life as well. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 31. Ephesians 4. 31. Let me read verse 29 to start with. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Gird your mouth. And the proverb says that uh, flies never come. You get into the mouth of those people that close their mouth. Which means then dirty things, corrupt things, polluted things, insulted, abusive language will not come out of your mouth if you close that mouth. And when you close your mouth, you will not get into trouble too much. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good, before you are going to talk at all, you want to talk to your brother, you want to talk to your sister, ask yourself quietly what I want to say now. Will it edify my brother? Will it edify my sister? And if the person I'm talking about, if he hears this thing I'm going to say about him behind, is he going to edify him? Will it encourage him? He says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit within you and it's your comforter and it's your companion. Of course, if you are sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost, you have much more of the power of the Holy Ghost and the anointing upon your life and it's listening to every conversation that you have. When you speak evil of your brother, it grieves the spirit. Why does he grieve the spirit? Because the spirit of God is saying, but you were like that before too, and you were forgiven, and God had mercy on you, and the love of God had been shown unto you. How can you say that about your brother, about your sister? In verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all all malice. Again, you see the companions of evil speaking here. It talks about bitterness. You know, when you are speaking evil about somebody, it's because actually there is some bitterness in you against that person. And if we have bitterness and hatred against our fellow brother, against our fellow sister, how are we with the Lord? What's our relationship with the Lord? And wrath and anger and clamor. And you see, they are all related. You are bitter, that's inside. You, the wrath is there, that's inside, and then anger, that may be shown in your face now, and clamor, that's already shown now, in the way you are shouting on that individual, and then evil speaking, backbiting, gossiping, slandering, tail bearing, going behind other people, and slashing them, and cutting them, and then it says, let everything be put away from you, with all malice, I pray the Lord will help us. And the grace of God will sustain us. So that all these things that mark out unbelievers and backsliders will not continue in our lives in Jesus' name. In Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Let's see what uh, the uh, Lord indicted some people for. What they did and he wasn't happy. And he rebuked them as the psalmist was talking about them. Psalm 50. Reading from verse 19. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue framest deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. You will see here that uh, the, the individual that uh, the Lord is talking about, he has forgotten that he was related to the person he was uh, talking about. But it says, this is your very mother's son. There are people that do it to even their own relatives. And there are husbands that will blackmail and spoil their wives in front of their children. And they will tell the children bad, bad things, uh, things that are not true about, their, about the mother. So as to poison the mind of the, of the children against the mother. 
And in fact, if the mother comes to see you in the school, you should not allow her to see you because she's a witch, because she is very bad, and that's in fact why I'm going to kick her out. You see, it says that they are speaking evil of the people they are related to. And then the Lord said, these things you have done. Although I've been keeping silent, and the judgment did not come immediately, you thought judgment will not come. I will reprove you and set them in order before thine eyes. In verse 22, now consider this. Ye that forget God. The word of God is telling us, while we're speaking evil of other people, we're forgotten God. You have forgotten that God is hearing. You have forgotten that God is watching, that is listening to everything that you are saying. He says, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. What's the attitude of a child of God? What will come out of the mouth of a child of God? Verse 23, whoso offereth praise, glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. If we want the salvation of God, if we want the goodness of God, we will order our conversation aright. You will see from what we have been learning from the word of God, that uh, one of the genuine tests of true conversion and gracious work of the Lord is that the Lord has touched your heart. He has transformed your life by grace so that you are not showing gratitude to God and love to your fellow men. Such a person will know that all his own goodness is he, he owes to the grace of God and you will not carelessly see it as judge over others. A heart that is full of love will not find it easy speaking evil of his fellow brother or his fellow sister or a relative or even a co-worker or anybody. What's evil speaking? Evil speaking includes things that are false that you say. Things that are untrue that you say about other people like lying, like slander, like tail-bearing, backbiting, gossiping, whispering, talking to condemn others in their absence. When they are there, you won't talk. Because you know that they will be able to defend themselves. They will say, oh, my brother, you are talking like that. It's not so. Did you forget this area? Did you forget this area? But when the people are not there to defend themselves and to supply information that will clear up the whole matter, you stab them in their bags. Evil speaking then includes what is said with the intention to damage the character and the reputation of our neighbor. It's a very common scene among the high and the lowly. And among uh, students in school and among uh, older people at home, it's a very common scene. Yet the commonness of the scene will not excuse anyone who speaks evil of his neighbor. Even if everybody is doing it and dishonoring the Lord, we are to obey God and we are to consecrate our lives to the Lord and refrain from evil speaking as children of God. And if you see that somebody is incurable as a person that is speaking evil, you have told him, brother, this is our conversation. I don't like this our kind of conversation. Every time we come together, we are always speaking, uh, you know, the uh, lives of other people about brother so and so, about sister so and so. Can't we find something better to speak about? And they will not change. If you see that they are going to get you into uh, their evil speaking, then you will cut them off. Because uh, if you are a hearer of evil, you encourage the one that is speaking evil to continue. In Psalm 101 verse 5. Psalm 101 verse 5. It says, who so privily, that means privately, slanders his neighbor. Him will I cut off. Meditate on that. Think about that. The Lord knows everyone. If you are privately slandering your brother, slandering your sister, the Lord is saying he will cut you up. Him that has an high look and a proud heart, will I not endure? Will I not permit? Will I not suffer? In Psalm 140, 140, 140 verse 11. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall haunt the violent man and to overthrow him. That's the reason why you will get rid of evil speaking at all costs. And you will not allow it to have any part in your life. And if we are willing to obey the Lord and love our neighbor, love our brothers and sisters, and we make a covenant with our mouth that we will not speak evil of our brother, evil of our sister, the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. 
And then the judgment that should have fallen upon us because we've been speaking evil of one another, all the judgment the Lord will erase because things are different now. We come back to, Hebrew, uh, to James chapter 4 and now in verse 11. He now tells us the reason why we should not speak evil one of another. We come to point number two. You're sopping the place of God, the lawgiver. In uh, chapter 4, verse 11 of James. Speak not evil one of another brethren. James, why are you telling us that? What's so bad in speaking evil of one another? Many, many things. But the highest and the greatest is this. He that speaketh evil of his brother judges his brother and speaketh evil of the law and judges the law but if thou be a judge if thou judge the law thou art not a doer of the law but a judge now he explains to us he says if we are talking carelessly and thoughtlessly about uh, our fellow brothers and sisters do you realize then you are not under the law you are not submissive to the law you make yourself above the law it means you have seen the commandment of god speak not evil one of another you say i'm above that the commandment of the Lord is unnecessary, it's improper, it's inadequate. And because that commandment of the Lord that says, don't judge one another, don't speak evil of one another, because it's, it doesn't pertain to me, then you set another law now, you make another law for yourself. You now become a judge over the laws of God. You claim to be wiser than God. But a man's duty is not to judge the law is to obey the law he who appoints himself god has not appointed you to be a judge over the law he has said but you have appointed yourself to be a judge over that law and you take your, to yourself the right to break the law of god you usurp god's authority and then you stand a condemned before god as lucifer was condemned before god you know what lucifer did lucifer said i will set my throne above the throne of god i will not be under the law of god and so when you disregard the law of god he says don't judge don't speak evil one of another and we're speaking evil one of another then you set yourself above the law of god in uh, romans chapter 2 Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. You see that we are very merciful concerning ourselves. You know that even though you are born again, you may have some faults that you are still praying. Oh God, it's, I'm not smoking anymore. I'm not committing adultery anymore. I'm not doing this evil, that evil anymore. But I know that I am not what I ought to be. There is this fault. There is this imperfection in my life. Please have mercy on me. Please uh, cleanse me. And please help me to improve and to march forward. While you are doing that, then you see a similar fault in the life of your brother, of your sister. And you know by the grace of God, they are children of God. And the similar faults in you, you find in them. Then you are talking. Then you are judging. Then you are accusing them. Then you are condemning them. And then you are saying things you ought not to say. It says, are you to be excused? When you know that you are doing the same thing, and you have your own problem, and then you are judging others, it ought not to be so. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 5. It says, therefore, judge nothing before the time. Uh, there is no time to be going about and judging and judging. Uh, the Lord has given us the message of love. And the message of reconciliation and restoration. So that we reconcile people with God. Even Jesus said, he came not into the world to judge, but he came into the world to save. And we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. The judgment day is still coming. Today is the day of salvation. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. 
who will both bring to light hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. And then shall every man have praise of God. And when God judges, he judges with knowledge because to him everything is open. To us, we don't know much. We don't know much. You may see an outward action and you may condemn that outward action. But uh, the motive of the person may be right and his intention may be godly. And then when you see the outward action and you're only judging and judging, it's not right. Because you do not know all the details as God knows the details. Refrain from judging and speaking evil one of another. Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let me show you an example. The people that thought they were right. When somebody got into trouble and then they came, instead of comforting him, instead of helping him, they were judging and judging and judging. Of course, in their judgment and speaking evil, they even mentioned the name of God. And they even brought in a doctrine of godliness and holiness and a lot of things. And yet, at the end of it, God said, they didn't know the details in Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42, reading from verse 7. Job 42, verse 7. And it was so, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said unto Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. You will remember the story. They didn't know the very important thing, why Job got into trouble, why Job's children died. And they didn't know why all his crops uh, were burnt with fire. They didn't know why he lost all his cattle. They didn't know why he had the sickness and the boil over his body. And then they came to him. They looked at his condition. And Job was saying, I don't understand this. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm righteous. In fact, I know that I am perfect. And then they began to condemn him. They said, you are not perfect. There must be a secret sin in your life. If there were no secret sin in your life, has this ever happened to a righteous man before? They said, check up in the history of humanity. This never happens to a real child of God. We know now that it was Satan that went to God and contested and said that Job was righteous, but it was for a reason. And then God gave him permission. They didn't know that. That's the reason we're saying we shouldn't judge one another. You may see something. Your brother is sick. Your brother has lost his job. His sister is having family problem. Then we jump into conclusion. Yes, we knew. She's not living right. It serves him well. It serves her right. And that's because uh, her life is not correct. How do you know her life is not correct? That's what the friends of a Job here did and God now condemned them and told them they didn't speak right concerning him. Look at verse 8. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. Do you, you see in verse 7, my servant Job? In verse 8, my servant Job. At the end of verse 8, the last line, my servant Job. Job was still a child of God, but they were telling him, we know you are a backslider. We know you have gone astray. We know you are a hypocrite. They were judging wrong. Maybe we are doing the same thing too. When other people get into trouble. And then we are judging them. And we are pointing accusing fingers to them. Therefore take unto you verse 8. Now seven bullocks and seven rams. And go to my servant Job. And offer for yourself a bunch offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly. They have been counseling him, but their counseling was wrong. They have been talking about him, but their talking was wrong. And he said, if you don't make the sacrifice so that I can forgive you, if you don't fully repent, I will deal with you because of your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me, the sin that in which is right, like my servant Job. 
Uh, that's what the Lord is telling us, that we ourselves, we ought to be very careful so that we do not come under the judgment of God because of judging our brethren. In John chapter 7, John chapter 7, verse 24. Here is what the Lord told uh, the people that were trying to judge him. And he told them how they should not judge. 7.24 Judge not according to the appearance. In fact, uh, the, the, the way to do it is that if you see something, keep quiet, watch, think, meditate about the whole thing. If you think that that thing concerns you and you need to do something about it, investigate it first and look for all that, the, the data that will give you proper information. Talk to the person first without making any accusation. Don't just go by the appearance of what you see. I think it is wrong. And then you just jump into conclusion immediately. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Let Christ be with you. Let the Spirit of God guide you. Let the Word of God guide you. Let the truth of God guide you before you can judge righteous judgment. And in fact, uh, there are times that even when things are wrong, you don't have any right to be speaking evil and to be judging. In uh, Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God is a final judge, and you will not take the place of God. You will not usurp the place of God. You will give all judgment into the hand of the Lord. That's what we're told in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, there in verse 4 and in verse 10. Romans 14. Verse 4 and verse 10. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? He's referring to a child of God, a brother, a sister. He belongs to the Lord. And if there is anything to correct, anything to judge, she is a servant of the Lord. He is a servant of the Lord. Who are you, by the way, that judges another man's servant? And to his own master, he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holding up. For God is able to make him stand. You might think he's weak, and therefore you beat him down, you judge him. God is able to make him stand. And then in verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother, thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? You make nothing of him, you belittle him, you cut him to a very small size. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's telling us in a word that God is the judge. And finally, we shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Let all judgment wait until that time. What you are to do now is to help one another, love one another, speak all the good you can about one another, refrain from speaking anything that is evil. And the blessing of the Lord will be upon our lives in Jesus' name. We come to point number three now. The unique position of the judge and lawgiver. The unique position of the judge and the lawgiver. We come to uh, James chapter 4 verse 12. There is one lawgiver, not two, just one, who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? From the construction of that verse, you will see that it's referring to Almighty God. It says there is only one lawgiver. Who is that lawgiver? Is the one that saves and is the one that is able to destroy. Who art thou then to stand side by side with God? Who are you then to take the place and the position of God? Who are you then to take the right of God away from his son? The responsibility of God away from his son? And then you begin to do what only God has the right and the prerogative and the sovereignty to do. That's still telling us that unique position and privilege belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. Stop judging one another. Now, the Bible tells us that God, Almighty God in heaven, is this lawgiver and judge. Look at uh, Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33, you'll find that God is a lawgiver and God is the judge. 
Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That's exactly what James has been telling us. He's saying only the Lord is the judge. Only the Lord is the lawgiver. And therefore, and he is the king. And he is the one that's able to save and he will save us. God occupies then a unique and sovereign position above all created beings. He is the only one who has the right to make laws and is the final judge. Only his laws are binding upon his children. And that means then you will not, you know, sometimes when we judge people, we set our own laws apart from the law of God to judge them. And by the law we have set for them, which God has not set, then we begin to judge them. But the laws of God are complete. When you set other laws by which you are judging your fellow brother, you are judging your fellow sister, it means you are saying God's law is not sufficient. God's standard is not sufficient. Therefore, you have to raise up another one so that uh, you will be judging them by it. That's not right. If we're children of God, if we be doing that, we ought to stop that, repent of it, and really follow the way of the Lord. In Psalm 96, verse 13. Psalm 96, verse 13. It's been talking about, uh, about something from verse 12. And it says in verse 12, at the latter part, Rejoice before the Lord. But now it goes on in verse 13, For he cometh, talking about the Lord, he, For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, And the people with his truth. We do not have all the truths to be able to judge our fellow brother. We do not know everything that we can use as a yardstick to judge our fellow sister. That's why we know that he will come, he will judge. He will put everything right in the proper perspective. Therefore, you will not take laws into your hand to be speaking evil and condemning and criticizing and gossiping and talking behind your uh, brothers, your sisters back uh, to criticize them. You will know that judgment is in the hand of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 and verse 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done. Whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. We know the terror of the Lord that when he comes, he will judge the people that have been critical. The people that have been gossiping. The people that have been destroying their brothers and sisters and their neighbors behind them. Because we know that terror of the Lord, we, that's why we persuade men that we should decease and get away from all these things so that by the grace of God, our lives will be what it ought to be. It says, but we are manifest unto God. And I trust also that we are made manifest in your, conscience, in your consciences. And then in um, Romans chapter 16, telling us that we are not wise enough to judge. Only God is the all-wise. is the one that cannot make mistake in judging. We can easily make mistake when we judge other people. When we criticize and condemn other people. That's why because we know we are human beings, because we know we can make mistakes, we leave all judgment in the hands of the Lord. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter 16 verse 27, To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And so we leave that judgment in the hands of the Lord. Let's come back to James now and uh, see what James has been telling us and uh, ask grace from the Lord. That what the Lord has uh, already commanded us in his word, by his grace, will be able to do. And the Lord himself, he will help us so that we'll get away from the condemnation that will come upon the people that are judging their neighbors. Verse 11, James chapter 4. Speak not evil one of another. Now we have heard the word of God, and it will take decision from us. 
it will take something from us to say, yes, I know that uh, I should not speak evil. It's been my habit. It's been a part of my life. I'm going to take a decision tonight. I will not do that again. And then it says, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. Uh, but if thou be, be judge of the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and uh, to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? I read a story of a woman who had uh, told an untrue story about uh, somebody. And uh, that uh, story, untrue story, gossiping, backbiting, evil speaking, she told it to somebody. And that person told it to the other fellow. Eventually, in that uh, little town, everybody heard about it. Eventually, the person that started that rumor, the person that started that story, uh, he uh, felt uh, guilty and then wanted to do something about it. He went to a wise man, a jet man in that community and said, eh, Please, sir, eh, I've discovered that I said something wrong. And now I want to correct it. The whole town is now carrying it about. And I know it's not correct. What am I going to do? And the wise man said, eh, Go and take a chicken. It's not sacrifice. It's not idolatry. Go and take a chicken and then kill it. And then pick all the feathers. As you are coming from the market, you will be putting the feathers on the road until you get home. And the woman was surprised. What does that have to do with what I've told you? And then he, she did that. And then that day she went to the man and said, I've done what you have told me to do. And then the man said, go back now and collect all the feathers from where you put them. And the woman went back, and then in trying to collect all the feathers, they had been blown away by the wind. She was only able to get about uh, two or three. And then came to the man and said, I'm not able to collect everything back. And then she, he said, that is it. Once you have spoken that evil word, once the evil word has come out of your mouth, you cannot collect everything back again. It's like egg that is dropped down from your hand. That's the reason why, you see, we need to correct our lives and say, Oh Lord, I know that I've not done right in the past. I want you to forgive me. I want you to cleanse me. And help me so that the damage I've done with my tongue, you will uh, re recover everything and heal the wounds in those places. But help me so that I will not continue. Because once you have done that thing, you cannot recollect them back again. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help me so that I will not continue speaking evil of my neighbor, speaking evil of my brother, speaking evil of my sisters. I was speaking evil of my wife, speaking evil of my husband, speaking evil of my children, speaking evil of my teachers, speaking evil of members of the church, speaking evil of our leaders, speaking evil of people. Lord, help me. It's a common uh, fault, it's a common sin with many, many people. But you will tell the Lord that the Lord will help you, that the Lord will help you, so that you will not continue this bad habit, sinful habit, that if we don't repent, if we don't stop, it will bring the judgment of God upon our lives. Speak not evil of one another, my brethren. 